taken. They cast stones with the men for the act of lapidation or stoning. They jostle to touch the black stone with men at their sides. Mixed worship does exist, and that's how it was in the mosques during the Prophet's time. Women attended the councils that were held in the Prophet's presence. They came of their own accord, unveiled and without discrimination, to consult with the Prophet on many topics. The conversations were direct. They spoke to each other directly. My point is that, if we want to interpret the situation of women, we have to interpret it as it was during the Prophet's lifetime. What happened during the decadent period when they segregated women and hid them away in the palace harems is a far cry from the tolerance that dominated during the Prophet's era. The relationship between men and women at the time was one of great tolerance. So there are some obscurantist elements that affected Muslims, not Islam, but that were attributed to Islam, even though they had nothing to do with the religion. that old demon insurrection reawoke in Medina a faction which the Quran referred to as the hypocrites joined with Muhammad's enemies and got together to plot the siege of the prophetic capital The Prophet, forewarned that all the infidels were coming together to attack him, gathered his companions to deliberate with them. They all thought they should lock themselves inside the city. Salman the Persian said, At home in Persia, when a large army comes to attack a city where the army is not fit to meet the enemy, we dig a moat around the city to stop the cavalry from coming in. The Prophet and all his companions approved Selman's counsel. In a month, the moat was finished. When the infidels saw the moat around Medina, they were struck with amazement. They had never seen one before. Unable to get over it, they came daily to the gates of the city. The infidels stayed there 26 days without a fight. Naim, a prominent figure among the attackers, to whom God had granted the inclination towards Islam, arose during the night, left his tent, presented himself to the Prophet, professed his faith and said, Apostle of God, I have long been a secret believer. Give me your instructions now. The Prophet told him, I want you to go back to the infidels and try to divide them. He coined the phrase, still used today, war is a game of cunning. He sent agents among them to stir up trouble. They killed each other, and on top of it all, it was winter. There was heavy rain, 
and the siege thus ended without combat. At nightfall, God unleashed a wind over the infidels' camp that overturned their tents. The enemy was filled with terror because a violent storm threatened overhead. Abu Sufyan decided to flee. The infidels left that very night, emptying their bags of everything that weighed them down. During the siege, the Muslims suspected the Jews of Medina, the Koraiza, of making secret contact with the besiegers at night. But a ruse by Noaim, the spy, prevented their access to Medina on the side he was defending. With the Meccans gone, the last Medina Jews knew they were done for. The angel Gabriel came to tell the prophet, God orders you not to lay down arms before finishing with the Koraiza. After a siege of 25 days, the Jews, down to the last recourse, finally requested surrender. What could be done with this Jewish tribe? Here we come across a new incident that reveals Muhammad's pragmatism. He would not be the one to decide the fate of this Jewish tribe. Rather, he appointed an arbitrator to rule in his place. He said, Saad, decide their fate. Saad said, kill the men, capture the children, and seize the belongings. The Prophet said to him, You have judged them with the judgment of Allah above the seven heavens. And so he issued a terrible decree. The women and children were to be sold as slaves and all the men executed. A pit was dug and the Koraiza approached one by one like little lambs to have their heads cut off. As with any new and emerging state, even the smallest retreat, the slightest hesitation could prove fatal. This is why it was often necessary to sacrifice large numbers of people in order to reinforce the power of the new state. The lesson was a terrifying one for the entire population of the Arab Peninsula. Everybody was terrified at the news of the execution of 900 people in a single day. This is the most dramatic episode. It was later used as propaganda by the Byzantine Christians, who accused Muhammad of being an imposter, a cruel man who had used force to impose himself. Mecca was shaken to learn this, for if the Prophet were to invade Mecca with his soldiers, they would kill them as they had the Koraiza. Other Arabs were petrified. All those who were still opposed or undecided were absolutely terrified. The process initiated with the Jews' refusal to recognize the prophetic nature of Muhammad's message ended in definitive rupture. In Muslim tradition, this separation is represented by the direct elimination